Welcome to the Art of Black Miami podcast, organized by Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. Our stories introduce emerging and experienced artists who make Miami an exciting place to live and visit. I'm Rosie Gordon Wallace, curator and arts advocate. Miami is my home since the 1970s. My passion is cultivating the vision and talent of contemporary artists from the Caribbean diaspora, artists of color, and immigrant artists. Many cultures and languages come together to shape the character of Miami. Today we introduce you to Anthony Reed. Meditation, praying, and journaling are key to his art-making process. Cultivating creative partners in Miami and beyond, he takes responsibility for sharing meaningful stories about Blackness in his paintings and murals. Lovely to meet you. I'm happy to be here. Happy to talk to you, Rosie. Tell me, where are you from originally? I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. My father was in the Marines, so I was actually born in Albany, Georgia in 86. And then my sister was born in um, San Diego, California. And then when he decided to come back to St. Louis for us to be around our family and things like that, that's when we moved back. So um, one of the difficult parts about St. Louis was that it suffers from a lot of like segregation. I mean, it's definitely like gotten a lot better over the years. But growing up there, it was like definitely like a space where you kind of had a little humbling. You know what I mean? My parents, they decided to put my sister and I into like all black Catholic schools. That way we could kind of learn like who we were and our history and things all the way from kindergarten or to senior year in high school. It seems as if family is really important to you. Family is super important to me because that was my first introduction to storytelling. What my mom used to do when we were kids, they would have this big shoebox of Polaroid pictures and they would pull them out and then just show us this moment in time and then they would talk about it. Like, oh, this is a day where so-and-so dropped this pound cake on the ground and we was all mad, but then we figured out we made another one and then here's a picture of it. And so for me, that was a huge moment in my life where I was able to go back in time with this picture. That's a great segue into perhaps why you chose sequential art making at SCAD. Absolutely. Please tell our audience what that is, why you were drawn to it. So sequential art is a very cute way of saying I got my degree in studying comic books. <laughs> That's really what it is. <laughs> it's the curatorial speaks way, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The way that I got into it was, number one, with family, like one of my really close cousins, he was really into comic books. Comic books really was the way I learned how to read, too, because I hated reading growing up. I'm going to be honest. I hated it. It was different when you got, like, pictures and you got heroes and you got these word balloons, and now you're using your imagination. So I realized that if I read words, that I can see the pictures in my head. So when I decided to go back to college when I was, like, 22, I was like, you know what? Um, having a son, I was like, you know, I really want to do something impactful, and this is how I want to take care of him. I decided, well, I'm going to go back to school. Community College in St. Louis, Florissant Valley is where I decided to go back. I went there, excelled there, and I was studying animation at the time. When I transferred to SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, they did this majors and minors fair. So I walked around and I, and I landed at the sequential art program. So I talked to one of the professors, uh, his name is Dove, who had become a mentor. He was like, man, you look like you know, you really kind of like this stuff. And I was like, yeah, man, this is, is this professional work? He's like, no, this is student work. I like student work. I couldn't believe that was student work. He was asking me these questions about storytelling. And he's like, do you want to be the person that controls the story or do you want to be the person that animates raindrops? So I was like, I don't want to be doing bouncing balls all day. And so he was like, check out one of our classes. And if you want to, you know, change your major. That day I went to my advisor, changed my major to sequential art and never looked back. So when I went to my first class, I went to the hall. It was people wearing Star Wars T-shirts, cat ear headphones, the nerdiest things. And I was like, I'm, I'm at home. How have you used sequential art? Uh, one of my professors, his name was Tom Lau. He had passed away six years ago. He was one of my hardest professors at SCAD. And one of the projects we had to do was a memoir comic. Basically like a moment in time in your life that really taught you something. And then we had to make a four-page comic about it. 
And so the story I chose was I was in St. Louis. I was a sophomore in high school, and it was the first time I had ever been pulled over by cops with guns in my face. And I I decided to try to draw this story. And I remember one professor, Dove, he like started crying a little bit because he was like, man, if, if you wouldn't have made it out here, you wouldn't have been standing in front of us at this school. I didn't quite look at it like that. I was just like, oh, it's just like a moment. You know, it's something that happened when I was 16. You know, I'm just letting it roll off. But he was like, no, man, like that's wild. So to fast forward to my life now and the art that I do now is with my commitment to the community and taking on the responsibility of telling people stories, I think it's really important to know a person, know the experience, and then like translate that. I heard that you're recently involved in a literacy project. This project is like my favorite thing right now. Carl Reed, who is one of the founders of Blind Forge Animation, employed me for my first job when I graduated from college. The literacy program is in the shape of a cartoon with the Line Forge Animation and uh, PBS Kids in St. Louis. This program in particular connects how I grew up all the way up into my professional life with sequential art to be an animation director for a cartoon that is specifically geared towards teaching kids how to read using comic books. So this cartoon is specifically multicultural, based in St. Louis, but the city is called Midland City. And these kids have to get these comic book characters that magically come out of the comic book. They have to use these big words in order to get them back into the comic book. It taught me a lot. So I, I figured out how to be a director in animation. And that's actually what I like more. To work with other people that can come up with the design and the storyboard. And if I have to draw over it, that's cool too. But being able to make sure that it tells the story that we want and it's effective, especially in this space where you're trying to teach kids how to read and make it fun. 2018, you came to Miami. Some of your first projects were murals. Are you still doing murals? Yes. Murals is the thing that has pretty much like changed my life, to be honest with you. As soon as I came here, one of the first murals I ever did was with Herman and his project, Hope Murals. And that's in the Juvenile Detention Center. Take us in. Describe one of them. So going to the Juvenile Detention Center, first of all, it was really different because I had never been in jail before, any of that, you know. So I remember just going in there, you have to take everything off, no earrings, no phone, no nothing. And then going past the threshold from being a civilian to being inside of this space, I just remember like walking in being like, man, like these walls are really tall, barbed wire. Like, I mean, all the kids are in single file line and things like that. Then you look around, you're seeing a bunch of murals up, a lot of color up. You're seeing a lot of messages up. You see a lot of positive energy on the wall. And Herman was saying that what they do is like in the program is that they'll pick the students that are on their best behavior to be a part of the process of making the mural. And so I came up with the idea. We gave it back to the kids. They liked it. What was the idea? I wanted to have a man breaking kind of like chains, but instead of it being chains, I wanted it to be like roses and thorns, something like that. At first it was in color, but the higher ups didn't want to identify the person as any skin color because they didn't want to project any kind of negative message in to say that it's only like African American or it's only brown. The the illustration of the person is a line drawing. So the most impactful part was when we were painting, I was telling them, like, man, you can be free, man. Go ahead and get paint all over this wall, dude. Don't worry about it. They're trying to paint inside the lines or being really careful. And then it's like, man, like, you know, you, you can be free right here in this moment. Isn't that profound that when there were no rules, they, they still, still wanted, wanted to paint the in the line? And this goes back to my son, too. I feel like for young men, we pretend that we don't want the rules, but the rules make us safe. So seeing them draw very timidly, I was like, no, you can express yourself here. Then we would have these moments when we're done that we can have like these little small roundtable discussions just to sit and talk to them. And just hearing their stories, I'm like, wow, like I was in that same situation before. The only difference is I didn't get caught or I was in the wrong place, wrong time, but was able to leave minutes before it could have got worse. The thing that really stuck with me, it's harder to express this because they're in the situation and I'm not, but it's just like, it's the mind. And I was like, you can not be here mentally if you wanted to. And think about what you actually want. And maybe that 
could possibly dictate your actions to where what you do could possibly get you out earlier. Maybe people have a little bit more time or a little bit more energy to just give you more. It was hard because like you really don't have an answer. The only answer I had was like, just be free and express it yourself. You know, mentorship is so powerful and I'm a big proponent of being a mentor and, and even with your conversation around the mind that you can be in one space, but our minds can take us elsewhere is something that we can all learn from. Are there other mirrors that you've been doing? I actually have something really cool. I'll actually introduce it here. I'll be doing a mural inside Windwood Walls for Juneteenth. The mural is definitely going to be super impactful, being one of the few Miami artists to put something up inside the walls. Those of us who live in Miami understand what that means. These are walls that are commissioned walls. You have to be commissioned by the Goldman family. What's your relationship that you've built with Jessica Goldman? First of all, Jessica is special. She's She is someone who means a lot to me, and she plays a huge role, kind of like mentoring me in, in a lot of spaces. And I met Jessica right after George Floyd was murdered. And I remember I had made this painting called Overtown. Like, I mean, I was depressed, too, just like anybody else to see someone pass like that on social media where you can't go anywhere else but on your phone. Everywhere you see it, it's on there. And I was just, like, really tired of seeing that. And I was like, you know, well, I got to put out what I want to see. I had meditated that morning and something in my gut, my intuition, my spirit was like, repost Overtown. Shift the conversation. So when I stuck that piece out, Jessica, she saw Overtown and she was like, I need to know this guy. I need to meet him. So I met her. We started working together. I did a couple of murals in Wynwood. And then she invited me to do the When We All Vote campaign, which was a digital mural project that was all over the country to encourage people to vote. And all of this, I mean, it goes back to the relationship. Like, it goes back to the relationships. And this is something I say, I think business is personal. And the reason why I say it's personal is because the people are the reason why things happen. Relationships all come from, like, you being authentically you. I am so curious to hear a little bit about your practice of meditation. And if you could link it to your art making. Before I started getting into the space where I'm at now and the art that I make, I was making art that I just thought looked good. Or I was making work that maybe I think people would like, right? And a lot of times, like, that didn't necessarily work. It took me some years to understand that your voice is not to just, like, remake what other people have made or remix what other people have made, which is fine too. There's a space for that. But I felt like I needed to do something that was outside of me. Meditation came because being an artist full-time is is very difficult when you first start. (laughs) Because if no one knows you, no one's going to buy anything you do. They're not going to give you no contract to do anything. So I started to think about, well, I want to be calm in all situations. And I just started reading a lot. I was reading The Power of the Subconscious Mind, Three Magic Words. I was listening to Abraham Hicks. I was listening to Bob Proctor and the T.D. Jakes, Michael Bernard Beckwith. And this is what happens, right? Listen to this and be like, oh, let me try a little bit of that. And that's what I did. And now I'm sitting in front of you. Sometimes in my head, it, it used to feel like traffic, the constant noise. And it was like every time I would try to make a decision when it was noisy like that, I didn't really like the outcome. Maybe if I learn how to like calm that down, then maybe I can make a better decision. The other thing that I started noticing too was my intuition. And so that that was something I started to listen to more. Mm -hmm. And the more I listened to it on small things that's like, did I have my cell phone on my keys? It started being like, hey, you should repost Overtown. Or hey, you need to call this person. Or you need to research this. Or you need to be ready for these other opportunities to come. When it came to my art, I learned that Instead of just looking up images of something I want to make, I had to live. Like, I had to just experience things and try to document those as, like, sketches. Because I, like, stopped sketching at a certain point. I just started taking pictures as my sketch. And then also I started journaling a lot. So the meditation calmed me down enough to realize that I just had to live, basically. And I learned that also from going to Africa. I went to West Ghana. Was that a residency as well? That was my first residency. With whom? The Near Project with Leanne Buchanan. And that was 2021. 
The one thing that really changed me, we went to Cape Coast Castle, which is one of the first like slave castles. Yeah. It's on the Ivory Coast, right next to this beautiful beach. You know, before I went there, like I thought like black was just like Americanized blackness. It was different going there, seeing people that look like me, like just existing, living their life, you know? And then you also seeing all type of people in there just consuming the history. Family reunions walking around, putting flowers down, and there's like memorials they're putting up and just like thanking their ancestors. I just remember the top of my head came off, the brain got spun around. You know, throughout your storytelling with me, mentorship is at the center of this. How are you functioning as a mentor now? Growing up in, in my community, especially in the Black community, there was a lot of men, but also in my family, a lot of women who always gave back. They were like the pillars of the community. My father was murdered when I was 10. He was a huge pillar in our family. When he passed, then it was just like all of that responsibility went on my mom or my grandmother and aunts and things like that. So seeing him do it and then growing up as a man too, I was like, well, I want to do kind of what he was doing in the way that empowers more people to do what they want to do. So here it is. I'm fresh out of SCAD teaching at the community college. I was the only black teacher, young too, had this idea thinking that no one's going to listen to what I'm saying. Like, I was completely floored when it was the opposite. When I went there, all my classes were packed. Kids were deciding to not take other classes just to take my class. And I took that as a huge responsibility to say, if they're coming to me, then I have to know what I'm talking about. I have to teach really well. I got to be really good with my communication and be able to translate this with the students. So teaching was my first way of mentorship because it was like, you know, I knew where these kids were coming from, um, been in those same situations, but then allowing the art to be a space where they can kind of use that to talk. And then as that went on, that was how I spawned my nonprofit organization. So what I would do is I would just stay in a classroom after I was done teaching. And some of the really good students that would come to the room, I'm like, all right, y'all can stay in here. As long as y'all do some work, you can stay. And they would just ask me questions about entrepreneurship. They would ask me questions about SCAD and what did they need to do. And I was like, you know, SCAD is a really great school, but it's not the school isn't what made me good. It was the work that I was putting in. <laughs> and then at that point, that's when I was like, you know what, I think I want to do more of that. Where are you now with the work? So my nonprofit is called Healing with Hughes. So Hughes is like Hughes as in colors, also Hughes as in human. Healing humans are using art and colors and storytelling. So it's three pillars. So it's basically youth development, healing with art, which is kind of like art therapy, but I'm not a therapist, so I don't say art therapy. Mm -hmm. Then the last one is community art activations and initiatives. My desires for Healing with Hughes is to impact, inspire, empower people that look like us and to give them another opportunity to do something that they really are passionate about, whether it's in art, whether it's business, whatever it is. What I would like to do long-term is to Award young people opportunities to do this. How can your desires for this nonprofit be activated in community? I've actually worked with one of my mentors, Nicholas Durant. He's a representative here in Florida. His office is right down the street from my house on um, Coral Way. And so he actually was the reason why I was able to legitimize my idea. Because at first, like, I was walking around saying Hillary Hughes, but then it was like, well, I, I kind of wanted to be something. A lot of the things I'm doing right now, the bigger ones, are still in development with some of my partners that I've been working with for the past five years to do something really special in Miami. It's just something that I want to just outlive me. Right. Like, it, it really, and it's something that I want to pass on. I am just so empowered by your focus on leaving a legacy. And that each time you make a mark in the public space, you're ensuring that your legacy continues. This was an Art of Black Miami podcast sponsored by the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. I am Rosie Gordon-Wallace. We recorded this conversation in the historic neighborhood of Little Haiti a mecca for Black art and culture. 
Art of Black Miami highlights the year-round art and culture scene in Miami's heritage neighborhoods and across communities in Greater Miami and Miami Beach. If you are enjoying our stories, visit artofblackmiami.com to learn more. Engage us on social media, post and share using the hashtag Art of Black Miami. The Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau is an accredited, independent, not-for-profit sales and marketing organization. GMCVB's mission is to attract visitors to Greater Miami and Miami Beach for leisure, business, and conventions. For up-to-date art events, promotions, and more information, visit artofblackmiami.com. <laughs>